Father, we come before you today, Lord. We thank you for your precious word. Father, we thank you that it is able to transform a heart, transform our minds. And I thank you, Father, for the power of your word. Let it speak to us today. Let us be changed by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we'll bring up our PowerPoint. Today we're talking about, last week we spoke about being ambassadors of grace. Uh, this is the second part of the message. And this week, as the Lord was downloading this message, I just wrote it out, and it's like 11 pages long. So we'll see how far we get into this message. But, you know, God has called us to be ambassadors of grace. And our responsibility as ambassadors, well, first of all, we need to understand what grace is. Okay? And I'm going to give you guys lots of scriptures, lots of points, and I want to just advise you guys to start taking notes so you can go home and study to show yourself approved. Uh, and just go over the material that we're sharing as a church and, and just begin to process it. So by the time you go to Connect Group, you're, you're, you're just full and you're ready to talk about the word, okay? But what is grace? Grace is God's divine influence upon our hearts. And you know, you've heard me say that a lot. God's come by his spirit. He's touched our hearts. He's transformed us. And he's influencing our life by his spirit. All right? God's grace is his unmerited favor. And how many know we need unmerited favor in our lives, right? And so we are a grace church. We believe in grace. We believe that grace is the culture of the kingdom, that everywhere we go, we have to be ambassadors of God's grace and God's mercy and God's truth, all right? And that's what God has called us to do. And um, the grace that we've received from the Lord, it's our responsibility before God. And what, he, he, what he's asking us to do is he wants us to take that grace that he's given and he wants, it to, he wants us to extend it to others, all right? Grace was never meant to be given just so that we could hoard it up and cap it. Grace was given so that we could give it away. There has to be a flow with grace. Grace has to come and has to flow. Jesus says, out of your bellies will flow rivers of grace living water. So there's life that comes. Grace brings life. Grace brings transformation in people's lives. And last week we spoke about how the reason why we're using the term ambassador is because there's a difference between an ambassador and an immigrant. I'm just touching on a little bit of last week. Immigrants come with the agreement to submit to the laws of the new land they're coming to. They have to submit to the laws. They have to submit to the culture. They come in and they they integrate into something that's established. But an ambassador is one who comes to a country, to a new land, to represent and establish the culture and the laws of the land they came from. And so God has called us to be ambassadors of the kingdom of God. So we're here to, to extend the culture of heaven. As it is in heaven, so let it be done on earth. Amen? And that's why when Jesus came, he came healing. He came to set the captives free. He came to set those who are oppressed free. Right? He came to open the prison doors. Why? Because he's bringing the culture of heaven to the earth through this vehicle of grace. And God wants us to do the same because we're ambassadors. Say, we're ambassadors of grace. And so the grace that we've received from the Lord, we extend to others. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, And God is able to make all grace, say all grace, all abound to you so that in, say all things, all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will be able to abound in every good work. And so grace is really the fuel that drives us and empowers us to do what God's called us to do. We need to be a people of grace. You know, last week we spoke about seven ways that we demonstrate grace of God to others. We talked about how not to receive the grace of God in vain. And then thirdly, we talked about how grace increases when we pray. How many know when we pray and we spend time in prayer, grace seems to increase in our lives. There seems to be an overflow of grace, and grace becomes sufficient for us. It begins to move us and drive us in life. This week, I want to talk about extending grace to the non-believer. Okay? Or the uninformed. I use the word uninformed because the uninformed is a person who has never had the gospel presented correctly. I've talked to people before in the past where, you know, they've been to church and say, you know, I'm not really into that God thing and I don't quite understand Jesus and all. And they've been to church, they've hung around Christians, and I'll sit down with them and I'll explain the gospel. And they're like, oh, I never knew that. That's great. Yeah, I want to accept the Lord. 
because they were uninformed. They didn't understand the gospel. The Bible says that how will they know unless preachers are sent to proclaim the word? All right? So they're uninformed. And so we want to reach the, we want to reach the sinner. We want to reach the person who doesn't know God. We want to reach the person who's uninformed. You know, I talk about Raymond, um, Joan, your brother. And I went to see Raymond, uh, and he was very sick with, with lung, lung cancer. And as I spent time talking with him, I spent quite a bit of time with him sharing the gospel, explaining the gospel. And I said, do you understand? He's like, yeah. And so I said the sinner's prayer with him, and I left. And a few days later, I talked with Joan again. I said, how's Raymond doing? And, and, and you told me. He's still questioning. He doesn't quite understand. I said, well, set up an appointment. I'm going back. And so I went back, and I spent another, another, I don't know how long it was, but I spent a bit of time. And I went back, and I explained from Genesis the whole process of our need for atonement and why we need Christ and the sins that we've committed and why we need to be washed from our sins. And I explained it even more clearly. And then I said, you get it now? And he's like, yeah, I get it now. I want to get saved. And so I led him to the Lord. And then on his deathbed, he was, he was about to pass away, and the nurses were all making a bunch of commotion in the room. And he said, shh, he said, God is here. And he went to be with the Lord. So how many know some people are uninformed? They need people to explain the gospel more clearly. Amen? And so that was a wonderful thing, and you're going to see your brother again soon, and that's wonderful. Not soon. Sorry, I take that back. <laughs> In the scheme of things, yeah. A day is as a thousand years to the Lord. So there we go. <laughs> Amen. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 says, So we are Christ's ambassadors. Who are? Say, we are. Okay, God is making his appeal through us. So we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. And that's our plea, come back to God. For God has made Christ who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins so that we can be made right with God through Christ. And we need to understand something here is that we need to understand that we are, say we are, we're Christ's ambassadors. God doesn't send angels to do his work. When he sends angels, it was always direct people to go to people to hear the gospel. Angels won't preach the gospel. It's the responsibility of us human beings who understand what it means to have the Holy Spirit living in us, to be able to explain it to others and to proclaim the gospel. It's our responsibility. And this word appeal, okay, God is making his appeal, is the word beseech, okay? And um, it actually means to call to one side. It means to call people near. And so our responsibility isn't to save people. Our responsibility is to call people, come near to God. Because as people come near to God, God will get a hold of them. Amen? Draw near to God and I will draw near to you. And so our responsibility is, is to say to people, you need to draw near to God. You need to come to God's side, and, and as you begin to share your testimony, as you begin to, to explain the gospel to people, you win, because what you're doing is you're drawing people near. Amen? And our responsibility is to draw people near to God. Another thing it means, it means that we need to speak to or call people through the process of call people near to address through exhortation, entreaty, comfort, and instruction. So there's four ways where to beseech people or appeal to people with the gospel. So we're going to talk about those four things, and we're going to add one this morning as we're going through. Okay? And so, number one, we're to call people through exhortation. Say exhortation. I get you guys to repeat so you remember and you don't fall asleep. So we need to call people through, through exhortation, and that means to address or to communicate emphatically, um, urging someone to do something. 
There has to be an urgency when we share the gospel. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to be loud or boisterous, but there has to be an urgency. If you understand what you've been saved from, when you understand that you've been saved from hell, you've been saved from sin, you've been, sa- you've been brought back into relationship with God, and you see your fellow man, your heart, there should be an urgency within you to say, you know, you need to come back to God. You need to know what I know. God loves you. God has a plan for your life. Don't walk in confusion. Anymore. There has to be an urgency. How many hear what I'm saying this morning? Anointing always produces boldness, and it produces a sense of urgency. And you just, you just feel like you have to share with people. And it's funny because uh, how many know John Hagee? Yeah. And John Hagee gets behind the pulpit, and he's a fireball. He makes me look timid. He's just, rah, rah, rah. He's just really uh, great. And it's, yeah, if, if you've ever met the man, I knew someone who met him. And, huh? Dad, you met him? Who's dad? Pierre, you met him. But the thing with, with, if you go to meet him, he's like, hi, how are you? And he's very shy, very timid, very, his personality, he's a total introvert. And he's kind of like, you know, cold fish type of handshake. Like he's not, he, that's not who he is. But when he gets under the anointing, he becomes another man. And you know, it's funny because I was going to business school and uh, this is, I had to do a presentation for my business, and so we all had to prepare a speech and get up and talk, and so I did mine, and everybody did theirs. And um, I had got up, and I shared my speech, and uh, I got an okay grade on it. And one of the girls in the, in the group uh, who we had the opportunity to lead to the Lord said, well, I'm going to come to church with you. And so we invited her to church. She came to church, and I was preaching that Sunday. And she was sitting there on her chair going like this. And I'm trying to preach, and I thought... Am I freaking her out or what's wrong with her, right? So I just finished my message and, and uh, at the end I said, I walked up to her and she goes, who was that? She goes, I saw you give a speech at the business school and she goes, the, you, you became another person. She goes, there, there was a confidence about you, there was a boldness about you and I never saw that. She goes, you just kind of gave a mediocre speech, but what was it? I said, that's God's power. That's God's anointing that comes upon me and there's an urgency that there's a message that needs to be preached. Amen? And that's what the anointing comes. And guess what? It comes upon all of us, whether you're standing in front of a whole crowd or you're one-on-one with someone. There's an urgency. You gotta, guys, you need to come back to Christ. Amen? Number two, we can call people near through entreaty. Okay? And that, that is kind of... Um, you know, it's the same thing. It's, it, 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 now you're not urging someone. Uh, you're not urging someone earnestly. You're asking someone earnestly. You just come right up, hey, get saved, man. Please, please come back to God. No longer are you just exhorting them, hey, it's a good idea. You should really look at this God thing. Now it's like, please come back to God. You're asking, and you're anxious about it because it's important. How many know your soul is so important? People's souls are important. When we understand what we've been saved from and how great our God is, there will be an urgency and there will be a need for us to bring the gospel with urgency. The third one I want to talk about is appealing through comfort. Appealing through comfort. Comfort is a state of physical ease and freedom from pain or constraint. And the beautiful thing is that we have an opportunity to bring comfort because we have a comforter. Amen? And how many know that God wants to comfort people in affliction? God wants to meet people's needs. Whether they're saved or not, he cares about them. Amen? Part of extending grace is to comfort people in difficult situations. This is what Jesus did, and Jesus brought comfort as well as exhortation and and entreaty. Jesus didn't just exhort and entreat people. Come to God. He actually came and comforted them in their need. And as, as, as a church, if we're going to model Jesus, if we're going to share his love, we have to do evangelism the way Jesus did it. And Jesus was willing to meet people's needs. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 to 37, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd, he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. And I want to say this, you know, there was a time in my life where it was like I... I I, on the outside, everybody thought I had it together. You know, I had a, I mean, obviously I was, I was a 
in my teen years, but I had a, I had a nice, car, new, nice new car. You know, I had a good job. I had a girlfriend. I had friends all around me. And people thought, yeah, Travis has got it all together, right? But on the inside, I was confused and I was helpless. Because even though people have an external image that everything's okay in their life, on the inside, there's this, you know, what if? What's my purpose? What's going to happen when I die? And there's that question. And if you don't even think about it, it's just there's a question of uncertainty there. And Jesus saw that and he had compassion for those who are in darkness. That the God of this world, Satan, has blinded their eyes. And so he's, he's saying, I'm, I have concern for them because they're confused and helpless. How many have ever felt compassion for people because you know they don't know? the grace that's available to them, all right? How many remember a time when you were confused? You know, like me, you know, we still don't have it all together, but at least we're not confused, right? At least we understand our purpose. At least we understand we're loved. At least we understand we have a place in eternity. And Jesus cared for those people. The next one is Matthew chapter 14, verse 14. When he went ashore... He saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them, and out of that, he went and healed their sick. You know, I think if we would have a compassion for people, we'd see more miracles. Can I hear you, man? That's, I mean, if we would literally have a, con a compassion to stick with people and pray with people until they get their breakthrough, because we are so compassionate for the suffering that they're enduring, and we just, we, we contend in prayer, we would see more healings. God wants us to be a people of compassion. Compassion is part of the culture. Um, here's one more, Mark, Mark chapter 8, verse 2 to 3. I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away, hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them will have come from a great distance. So Jesus was concerned about meeting people's needs. Okay? Some preachers would say, oh, it's okay. They've come a long way, but they can just fast. God will bless them. Just, they can fast and pray, bless the Lord. And, oh, by the way, pass the offering by. Right? You know, like it's, but Jesus had compassion. He said, I'm going to meet their needs. I'm going to take care of them. Okay? So compassion is part of the culture. And compassion should be part of the atmosphere that we have. Do you know we have an atmosphere around us? And we create an atmosphere of, of grace around us. That should include compassion. When we get around people, they say, you know what? You're different than other people. You care. You look at me when you talk. You, you actually look into my eyes, and you really, you really care. You lean in. You listen. You, you care about me. You're willing to get in the well and try to get me up. You're not at the top yelling down saying, it'll be okay. No, you're, you're getting in. Right? And God is looking for a people who will move with compassion. So... I think it's important that compassion is very important in reaching the non-believer. Compassion is important for reaching the uninformed. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus fed the multitudes. And there's one more way here that we have to um, appeal, and this is the fourth one. We need people near through the, we lead people near, we call people near to God through instruction. Through instruction, okay? And so we need to know enough of God's word. I mean, to lead people to Christ. How many would agree with that? Amen? Uh, we have a problem today in North America where there, people are biblically illiterate. They don't know the scriptures. Uh, they're not able to quote enough scripture to explain their salvation. Uh, and, I, you know, I pray that's not the case here. But the reality is we've, people have gotten away from reading as a whole. And we have to be a church that says, we're going to get into the word of God. I read this, uh, this article called Dumb and Dumber uh, by Ed Stetzler. And it has to do with biblical illiteracy that's happening right now in North America, okay? It says here, study after study in the last quarter century has revealed that American Christians increasingly don't read their Bibles, don't engage their Bibles, and don't know their Bibles. It's obvious. We're living in a post-biblical literate culture. Just as critical is the, uh, is the second word uh, of God literacy, Pew Research tells us that 23% of us didn't read a single book in the last year. That's three times the number who didn't read a book in 1978. So you can see the difference. All right. Whether it's the internet, video games, or TV, or increased time spending on entertainment and sports, Americans aren't spending or are spending less time between the pages of any book, not just the good book. 
The situation should be different with Christians. We believe the Bible is the word of God. It's divinely inspired. We believe that. Um, and to experience the Bible firsthand, the whole people, whole people groups have learned to read and new translations were created. Yet a recent LifeWay research study found that only 45% of those who regularly attend church read the Bible more than once a week. All right. So we'll go to the next slide. I think there's a slide there. Uh, go again. Yeah, there you go. So 45% of uh, those who regularly attend church read the Bible more than once a week. Over 40% of the people attending are reading their Bibles occasionally and maybe once or twice a month, if at all. Okay? And 18% of attenders say they never read their Bible. And so that was a survey they did across churches in America. And so what's happening is people are becoming biblically illiterate. And Christians are running into people like Jehovah Witnesses, and you know uh, Mormons and and uh, and they they have no arsenal. They don't know how to to defend their faith. So don't let that bring condemnation, but let that bring a challenge to your spirit. Say, I'm going to start studying my Bible more if you fall into that category, because God wants you to um, to grow in your faith. Amen. So one of the things I really want to challenge you to do is. Um, is to, uh, for homework, is just take, take, go online, find the Romans Road, or find, um, find what we call the four spiritual laws, which is a, a system of scriptures, and just begin to memorize and get them in your spirit so that you feel that you're equipped, all right? So that when you go to share the gospel, you have some, some it's not just your testimony. Your testimony is powerful, but you need to give some scriptural background to why you believe what you believe, amen? So that's a challenge I want to put out to all of you guys, is just say, listen, make a plan, a strategy to Get the word of God in you deep enough that you can share your faith, not just your testimony, but give scriptural reference. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right? Because we need to draw people through knowledge, right? We want, we want to exhort them. We want to entreat them. We want to give them comfort. But we also want to give them knowledge. And knowledge is very important in this. And so sometimes before Jesus even preached the message of the kingdom, he demonstrated it. And so he was one who would demonstrate the kingdom. How many of you guys think about uh, evangelism? When you hear the word evangelism, most of us think going door to door. We think about uh, handing out tracts or we think about, um, you know, special events that we do to get people to come in and all that. And, and, and evangelism can be those things. But evangelism to me needs to be a lifestyle. It has to be a lifestyle that you, through relationship, you're trying to disciple people, you're trying to lead them to the culture of the kingdom, you're trying to show them how to live the Christian life, you're trying to explain to them with your life. Does that make sense? All right? So, so the gospel is not just a message, but it's an atmosphere of grace that attracts people to God. I said evangelism is not just, it's not just a message. It's, it's an atmosphere that you create in order to draw people to God, okay? And so we need to have an atmosphere. Say, I need to have an atmosphere. <laughs> All right. So let's go to the next slide then. All right. So the fifth way of appealing, there's one more here. We call people near through God's power. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk, right? It is living by God's power. And so when we live a life that not just ministering by God's power, but living life through the supernatural. And, and people begin to see that. People begin to see the power of God in your life. They begin to see uh, the blessing of God upon your family, upon your health, upon your life. And they begin to say, hey, what's different about you? You're living by God's power power, all right? And so that doesn't mean that nothing bad will ever happen. It doesn't mean that, you know, uh, you're not going to have bad days or attacks in your life. It just means that you're going to be able to live in a supernatural manner. Amen? So we have to live with the power of God. And that is a tool to draw people near to God. All right, let's go to the next slide. Here's a situation that I'd hate to be in. But this was a situation that Paul was in. And then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul. They dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. And um, 
However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made new disciples, they returned to Lystrium, Iconium, and Antioch, okay? And and I I, I just find this is amazing because, you know, the multitudes, say multitudes, okay, had stones. Like, get a picture of this. And they stoned Paul. And what it it used to look like when the multitudes would stone somebody, at the end you would see a pile of rocks with maybe an arm hanging out, okay? I mean, it wasn't just a couple stones. He was stoned, all right? Some theologians believe that that was the time in 1 Corinthians when he he writes, there was a time out of the body or in the body, I do not know, I was brought up into the third heaven. You know, some people think that was the time that he was stoned and he was dead, okay? But they supposed he was dead. They drug him out and they're laying him out of the city and the apostles gathered around. And because there was an atmosphere of God's presence and power, as they gathered around and prayed, Paul jumped up. And he went to Trenton Memorial Hospital, to the emergency. No, he didn't. Like, even if he wasn't dead, he was probably mangled up pretty bad. So he probably would have to take six months, right, to recover and maybe have body casts and everything. The Bible doesn't say it. It says he got up and immediately went back to the place where there were, people were stoning him to preach the gospel. What is that all about, right? That's because, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. When the body of Christ gathers around you, you will rise up. When believers get, that's why you need it not to forsake the fellowship with the believers. Because when, when the believers come around you and you're going through a tough time, there's a corporate anointing to lift you up. There is. And I've had times where people would come and ask for prayer for me during the week. Or, and I'm alone and I'm praying for them for a breakthrough. And it might be a big thing. And I'll say to them, listen, if there's a prayer time, altar time on Sunday, I want you to answer that altar call for healing. They're, well, well, can you do it now? Yeah, I pray for you now. But there's something about when all the believers are around. There's an atmosphere of grace. Because it's not about the preacher. And it's not about the worship person. It's about the body. We carry the atmosphere of God with us. And when we bring the atmosphere of God and we gather around one another, we rise up to our ministry and our calling. And nothing can knock us down. And that's what happened with Paul. He rose up. He rose up and he went and did what God called him to do. All right? And I believe this totally, that the gospel is never fully presented without miraculous signs. All right? The gospel fully presented is a supernatural gospel. There's, there's always miracles or signs and there's wonders. Romans chapter 15 verse 19 says, They were convinced by the power of miraculous signs and wonders and by the power of God's spirit in this way, Paul says, I have fully presented the good news. Well, I don't know about you. I want to fully present the good news. And I believe that if we have a supernatural gospel where lives are being healed, where marriages are being restored, where children are getting, you know, healed, I'm telling you, when the gospel is full of God's power. And that's the gospel that we want to preach here at the crossroads. Amen? And sometimes the wonder, sometimes the miracle is a silent miracle. Sometimes it's something that just happens inside, and it's like, you know what? I used to struggle with this, and all of a sudden it's gone. Once I was blind, but now I see. It should be something that just you know about it, but somehow God took it from you. It doesn't have to be this big thing, but it would be something that you know. It was the power of God that changed you. It was the power of God that transformed you. Amen? All right. And... um, And it's real to you. You know, I remember when I was trying to quit smoking. Some of you heard this story, but I tried and I tried and I tried. And then I went to church and I got saved. And then I was getting really active in the church. And I was um, involved with the youth ministry. And I would be like, okay, uh, I'm going to run out for a minute. I'd go out and have a cigarette. And then I'd come back and pray for people. And that's kind of where I was at. I was just really, really wanted to be free. And then one day I was sitting in a meeting. They had a, a guy come to give his testimony. He was a biker. He looked like Hell's Angel guy sitting on the stage. And he started giving his testimony. And he said, um, he said the, the way God delivered me from smoking was, um, I just prayed a simple prayer. And I said, God, 
make it so my body will, will reject cigarette smoke. Like, make me allergic to nicotine, was his, was his prayer. And he said, um, and then after that, every time I smelled nicotine, I got sick and I never smoked again. So I thought it was really cool. So I, I went to my, a friend of mine and I said to her, I said, listen, we both need to quit smoking. Let's pray the prayer. So we prayed the prayer together. God, make us sick. Make our bodies reject cigarette and nicotine. God, just take this thing away from us. And, and you know, and, and we were kind of half serious, but we prayed the prayer. And um, the, the funny thing is the next day, I went uh, over to my friend's house. He was helping me put a new radio in my car because I needed more bass in the back. So we were putting a new radio in my car. And he goes, here, hold my cigarette. So he put it in my hand while he was working on the thing. And I literally, I was like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw up. Oh, my goodness. Get this. And I couldn't breathe. And I said, dude, you got to take your cigarette. And he took it. And I think that was the last time I had a cigarette. I just couldn't stand the smell of, and I was, that is a miracle. And somebody else might say, well, it's just psychological, but I know it was God's spirit working and helping me to overcome. So then later that day, I went, uh, you know, uh, I went to visit my friend, and uh, she couldn't talk. I said, how are you doing? I lost my voice. I said, you had a cigarette, right? She's like, yes. <laughs> and that was the last time she smoked. But this is real, man. This stuff is really, really cool. When God starts intervening in your life in this kind of way, you begin to realize, hey, he cares about me. He, the, the gospel isn't just a message. There's power behind it. The Holy Spirit, he's, he's not just my friend. He's, he's going to come and help me through my, tr my trials and through my struggles. Amen? And that's what God does. All right? And we see that Jesus said that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. What? to preach the gospel, to do all kinds of miracles, heal the broken heart and all that stuff. And then he tells the disciples to tarry in Jerusalem to you, man, dude, with the same power from on high so that you can go out and do the same thing. And that's exactly um, the God that we serve. He's a good God. I want to read just one more story, and then we're going to close. I'm only a half into my message. Next week I'll finish it because there's a whole bunch of stuff about revival history that you guys are going to really like. So, but we're, gonna, we're just going to go here. Acts chapter uh, 5, verse 14 to 16. Okay? It says this. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, the multitudes gathered from the surrounding cities of Jerusalem to bring in sick people and those who were tormented by evil spirits, and they and some of them were healed. No, they were all healed. And I love that verse. I love the word all because God, didn't, God, God took care of everybody. Why? Because Peter, Peter understood Psalm 91. He that dwells in the shadow of the Almighty... He that dwells under the shelter of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And because he abided in the secret place of prayer with God, it was almost like God's shadow overshadowed him. And those, wherever, Paul, wherever Peter went, God's shadow went with him and people got healed. Isn't that good? I want to say that this morning that we have an atmosphere of grace around us. We have an atmosphere of compassion around us. We have an atmosphere of God's power that's around us. And we need to believe that and walk in that. Whenever you go to talk to someone about Jesus, whether you're trying to exhort them, entreat them, whether you're trying to comfort them, whether you're trying to bring knowledge, you have to be aware of the fact that you're bringing an atmosphere with you of God's Holy Spirit and miracles are about to happen. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together and we're going to pray. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you've called us to be ambassadors. Each and every one in this place, Lord, you've filled us. You've put your spirit within us, Lord. And as we're filled with your spirit, God, as we go, we have an atmosphere of grace. We have an atmosphere around us that is going to touch other people's lives. We believe it, Lord. That's why you told 
uh, the disciples to tarry in Jerusalem to be endued with power because you didn't want this just to be a message. You wanted to be a demonstration of the kingdom and the culture of heaven. I thank you for every person in this place. Lord, I pray right now for divine opportunities for every person in this place that this week they'll run into someone, that they'll have an opportunity to exhort, to entreat, to comfort, or to bring knowledge to them concerning the kingdom of God. And on top of that, let them be aware of the power of God that's upon them for the work of the ministry, Lord, because you filled us with your spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.